when a person first hears about brain fingerprinting or sees we put a headband on somebody's head and we can tell if they're an FBI agent, we can tell if they're a terrorist, we can tell if they've committed a crime, it sounds as if, well, maybe we're reading minds or something of that nature. Brain fingerprinting is not mind reading. It's a very straightforward scientific procedure and all we can tell, we can't download the contents of your brain, all we can tell is does a person recognize these specific details as significant in this context? We have to know exactly what we're looking for. Okay, in this test you'll see an item that one of the suspects was wearing when he was apprehended. Brain fingerprinting is a fascinating application of a well-established science. You ready? Essentially, it is a multiple choice test given to the brain, where each option elicits a brain wave response. That response is then recorded and analyzed by Dr. Farwell. We don't have a choice about making these particular responses. When something significant comes up that we notice, the brain is going to say, aha, aha, yeah, that's something important to me. As a way of testing the technology, Innovation asked Dr. Farwell to conduct a blind test using a crime that had been committed on a farm near the town of Fairfield, Iowa. The police caught a perpetrator in the act of committing a robbery. He pled guilty to that crime and served two years in jail. Dr. Farwell was given the police reports, but was not told who had committed the crime. Four volunteers were asked to participate in the test Dr. Farwell did not meet any of them before they were brain fingerprinted. The four subjects were told no details of the crime. They were not told where it happened or what was stolen. One of them, however, was the guilty man and knew what had taken place. Now you understand today we're going to be measuring your brain waves. Yes. And we're going to determine whether there's certain information stored in your brain about a particular crime that's been committed. Yes. All right? So you'll see words. You'll push a button in response to each word, one button or the other, and I'll tell you which one. And you'll have a headband on your head that's going to be measuring your brain waves. In any good scientific test, there are control and experimental groups. In essence, things we know measured against things we want to find out. The same is true in brain fingerprinting. Dr. Farwell presents a subject with three different kinds of information, or stimuli. The first are the control group, what he calls targets. Targets contain information that we know the subject knows. There are details about the crime that we tell him. He may have learned those from some other source as well, but we're sure that he knows the targets. The purpose of the targets is to get a brain response that indicates that, in fact, yes, the subject does recognize this. Yes, he does know this. Targets are going to be the control group for a positive response. So Dr. Farwell must make sure that the subjects recognize these stimuli. He does so by providing them to each subject just before he administers the test. Let me see, all right? Okay, read them to yourself. All right. So these are the ones that you're going to have to know, okay? All right. You're going to have to be able to recognize these when they come up on the screen, and they'll flash very briefly on the screen. So in other words, you're going to know what the correct answer is in some of those lists. So take a look at this and make sure you know them and you'll be able to recognize them. Once a subject has read the targets, his brain should fire a spark of recognition when they are presented during the brain fingerprinting test. The second kind of stimuli are what Dr. Farwell calls irrelevance. They are the control stimuli for no recognition response. Irrelevant stimuli are words or phrases or pictures that are irrelevant to the person. They have nothing to do with the crime. They're not significant to the person. They're just, they're things he doesn't know, things that he won't find significant. And that gives us a standard for information that he doesn't know. So if irrelevance are Dr. Farwell's yardstick to measure no recognition, it's essential that the subjects not know those stimuli. And the best way to ensure that is to simply make them up. The third kind of stimuli Dr. Farwell calls probes. 
Probes contain information that is relevant to the crime, but that the person has no way of knowing if he wasn't at the crime. Probes are the experimental group, those stimuli that only the individual who committed the crime could reasonably know. Dr. Farwell selects them from the police reports. We flash probes mixed in with other things that would be equally plausible for somebody who doesn't know about the crime. If the individual was there, he'll know which is the right option, and his brain will say, aha, that's it. If he wasn't there, he'll see grain bin, he'll see office building, he'll see storefront. He won't know which is the right item, and he won't get that kind of aha recognition response. So each of the four subjects knows the targets. They don't know the irrelevance. And Dr. Farwell will attempt to find out which one of them will recognize the probes. In this test, you're going to see an item that one of the suspects was wearing when he was apprehended, an item that was in the possession of the suspects when they were apprehended, the item the suspects were stealing, and where the crime was committed, the kind of place, dwelling, or establishment. OK, just relax. Look at the center of the screen. Okay, just relax. We ran 30 different tests, and each one of them lasted for four minutes. And during each one of them, he saw three targets, three probes, and 12 irrelevants. And he saw each of those several times for a total of between two and 3,000 stimuli that were presented. And we measure the response a number of times, and then we average those. All right, good. In this case, the local law enforcement authorities were trying to catch somebody who was running a methamphetamine lab. So the people who were running this meth lab were stealing anhydrous ammonia from a particular location on a farm. The authorities staked out this location, and they caught two suspects in the act of attempting to steal anhydrous ammonia from these tanks. Stealing anhydrous ammonia was one of the probe stimuli. That was what the crime was. This grain bin was another probe stimuli. It was a, a landmark that they would have had to see to have been here. Also, what the perpetrators did at the time of the crime. There was a sequence of events where they got out of the car, they brought with them a flashlight that were used as probe stimuli. With knowledge of the crime, Dr. Farwell was able to come up with very specific probes but it remains to be seen whether these probes would reveal the perpetrator. OK, these are data for subject D. At this point, we presented the stimulus. This is 1.6 seconds later. So this axis is time. And this is voltage. So you can see there is a voltage increase and then decrease. The targets, represented by the red line, he clearly recognized those. That's no surprise. We knew he would. We told him what they were. The irrelevance are represented by the green line, and he doesn't get that marked response to the irrelevance. The critical question here is, does he recognize the probes? Now, the probes clearly go right along with the irrelevance. The blue line matches the green line. So what that means is that those probes, those details about this specific crime, were irrelevant to that particular subject. OK, this is Mr. B. This is the second subject who came in. Again, he recognizes these targets. There is a very clear peak that takes place in the red line. He's recognizing the targets. And then he doesn't recognize the irrelevance. You don't see that recognition response to the green line. Here in this case, however, this blue line represents the probes. Those are details about the crime that we didn't tell him. But clearly, his brain recognized those details about the crime. Subjects A, C, and D did not know the significant details of the crime. Subject B had a very clear record of the significant details of the crime stored in his brain that he had no other way of knowing other than committing the crime. 
It was, in fact, Subject B who had been caught in the act of stealing anhydrous ammonia from this farm just outside of Fairfield, Iowa. It was Subject B who had pled guilty to this crime, as Dr. Farwell was able to determine from his brain fingerprinting test.